Welcome to the Albany Film Festival presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. My name is Paul Grandall. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. Very excited about our guest today, Tony Lobianco. He's an acclaimed award-winning actor of the stage, been in many Broadway productions, over 100 films, including the Academy Award-winning film, The French Connection. He's also won two Emmys, including an Emmy for his portrayal of New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. The show is his honor. And he's uh, also directed uh, film and TV. Our conversation today is going to be on the 1970 cult classic, The Honeymoon Killers, that Mr. Lobianco starred in as Raymond Fernandez. And we are going to be screening that at the drive-in, the Malta drive-in as part of the Albany Film Festival. And it's a great honor to have you joining us, Mr. Lobianco. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm very uh, honored to be here and talking to you about this particular film because it was my first film and I'm very, very proud of it. When people ask me what my favorite film is, be believe me, this film comes to, uh, uh, to mind right away. That's great. So we're so <laughs> grateful for you joining us. Um, so this film was shot in 1968, released in 1970, and the writer director was a, he's, he's passed away, but a faculty member at the time and the University of Albany music professor, Leonard Castle. What do you remember about Leonard Castle? How, how did he work uh, on that film? Well, uh, you know, I guess we should go back uh, to the beginning right. and, and, try, and try to put, a, put the, the creation of the film in perspective if you don't mind. No, I'd love to hear yeah. it. May I do that? I, uh, you know, my, my life was, was theater uh, for many, many, many years before I did a film. Uh, so uh, when I was at the theater that I created, uh, the Triangle Theater in New York City, I was the artistic director and founder of the theater um, on uh, 88th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. So I was there and an actress came to me and said, this, uh, there's a, they're casting a part that you should go up and see, uh, in the Honeymoon Killers. So I called over there and uh, the woman who's casting woman said, uh, how, who, uh, who, first of all, who are you? Uh, secondly, uh, how, how, how old are you? And I think I was 30, some 30 years old. So she's, oh, you're much, much too young for this part and so on. And, and we're only casting a, a, a Spanish uh, people, uh, um, uh, Puerto Rican or Spanish people. So I let it go. And then the actress, uh, Marilyn Chris, actually her name is, she said, you know, they still haven't cast that part. You should really go up. So I did. I went up there and the woman said, what are you doing uh, here? And I said, well, I'm going to do this part. She said, oh, I told you, you were too young. I said, just a minute. So I, I turned around, put my hand on my head, uh, hair, pushed it straight back, came to her and, and spoke to her in a Spanish accent. And she said, oh my God, oh, oh, oh okay, okay, I'll send you in. So I went into the office and Leonard was there and, and, uh, and no director, by the way, um, and the producer, a couple of producers. And so I, I spoke to them in the, Sp in the Spanish accent and, uh, uh, and uh, I uh, got the part. And, and during, they asked me if I would stay there and cast, uh, help them cast a woman. And I did again in, in Spanish accent. I never spoke to them without the Spanish accent. So uh, one of the producers said, you think we could send him to school and learn to speak English? <laughs> so the casting woman finally said to them, you know, he doesn't really have an, an accent. And they said, what? Oh, Tony, speak to us without the accent. I said, no, sir, not until I sign the contract. And I never did speak to them without the accent until I signed the contract. <laughs> And uh, yes, that we got Shirley Stoller, and uh, and then we went on. Now that's the first time I heard the name Martin Scorsese. He was a young man who had <clears throat> directed the, uh, I think, some kind of a movie with a, a only a truck in it, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't. Hmm. It's totally unknown. Right. So <clears throat> so Martin directed a couple of scenes, uh, a scene by the uh, the lake scene, and and one by the. Uh, the counter with Shirley when I'm leaving on the train station and in the train. I believe that's the only things I worked with him on in the in the in the movie. And I know Shirley worked with him with a, with a few things, but then he got let go, 
And uh, I never did find out the real reason. I, I understood that, you know, that those days they were shooting with film and, and Martin was, was panning a lot of things and not doing enough close-ups for, for the producer's sake. And I think that's why they let him go. So basically we had no director uh, going forward. And uh, another gentleman uh, took over as director and uh, I don't think he had much experience in directing. He also, uh, um, uh, I think he did, not, I don't, I don't he, I, well, let's just put it, he didn't, have, he didn't have much experience in directing. And I don't think I've ever spoken to him during his tenure, which was very short. And basically, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Oliver Wood was the was the cinematographer. <clears throat> now Oliver's gone on. I right. think was an English boy. He had gone on to be a big cinematographer. He did a, all the, the Bruce Willis films uh, right. and, and and many others. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, between my experience of uh, theater and many years. Um, he, uh, he and I would get together, I, I, I work with him, and we proceeded the film, doing the move. Now, <clears throat> let's keep, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Let's keep in mind that Leonard Castle, who wrote the script, uh, had no experience, his first writing of, of, a, of a script. Right. He's a, he was an opera, opera fellow. Uh, and wrote wrote scores and so on for operas. So uh, when he first I first got the script from him, it was it was very very thick, and I knew then I said it's, you, you, it's too thick. You'll be here forever shooting shooting that thing. We have to cut it down. So I worked with him before we started shooting, and we cut a lot of stuff out. You know, you'd be amazed. I'd love to see the original script. If I can remember, there was chattering teeth at being thrown down the the. The, the, the roadway, there were all kinds of crazy stuff in the, in the piece that we, uh, we cut out. So about um, a week, uh, a week and a half left in the movie, uh, we saw that this director who had much experience, didn't have much experience, they, they, he wasn't doing much and it was, we were working with uh, Oliver, uh, Oliver Wood and myself and, and putting the movie together with the shots and so on. And in and the, and the end, about a week and a half before we concluded, Leonard said, well, you know, I'm going to take over as, as director. So he, I mean, he was on the movie for about a week and a half, two weeks. And, uh, and uh, we, at the, at the end of the movie, and, and, and that's how it became directed by Leonard Castle, written and directed by Leonard Castle. That's so, a great story. Well, that's the truth, and 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 uh, as as it was, you know, the movie was quite successful as a cult classic, and right. and very true and very real, uh, and it was a true story. So, yeah, so yeah, it's based on these nineteen forties, you know, uh, murderers, uh, Martha Beck, Raymond Fernandez. He was the con man that 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 trapped these lonely women with newspaper classified ads, went all around the country. Uh, seducing them, conning them, draining their bank account, then killing them. But he's executed. There's no spoiler alert because this film's been out over 50 years. So he's executed in Sing Sing. So you never got to meet him. In 1951, he was executed. How did yeah. you research about him? How did you try to learn about the real crimes? Well, there were great newspapers. Uh, this was a this was a heck of a case, and 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 and, and newsworthy, all over the place. There was so much information about it. Now, one of the one of the uh, interesting things about the uh, the trial that uh, Ray between Ray Fernandez and Martha Beck. In fact, she was I think she was the second woman ever to go to the electric chair, right. uh, and. Um, uh, it was a notorious uh, a, a trial where she, when she testified, she said the only, she talked about his, uh, his prowess as a lover and so on and so forth on the witness stand in graphic terms. And then also said her only regret was that she could not sit on his lap in the electric chair. Right. <laughs> and that's how much she loved him. You know, it's a, it's I mean, that's a, a you bring that out in the role. You you are so um, you, you you're so compelling and charismatic. Um, how did you create that role? So it was pretty much from newspaper clippings and then create him. Or did you feel like you were trying to channel the actual killer? Or was it was a totally original uh, creation. Well, you know, 
yes, it, it, it was something that I believed that the man <clears throat> was doing his job. That was his job, right. you know. He, uh, uh, you know, there's 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 interesting. There's an innocence about uh, people that are that are involved in criminal acts or so on and so forth. They have a they have a justification for what they do, uh, and we as as viewers say, you know, this guy robbed the bank or this guy killed this person and so on and so forth. But in their, their state of being, and so, so his job was to romance these women, uh, and if they caused him problems, he'd get rid of them. And, uh, and she happened to be one of his clients and, and, in, and, and fell in love with him. Right. And when he exposed who he is and what he does, she said she didn't care. Right. She loved him and she wanted to accompany him, right. you know, so, so there is, there is a, uh, a, you know, a, and then she started getting jealous of him, you know, um, and I don't want to tell the movie because no, I, I mean, it. exactly. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, a brilliant interaction between you and, and uh, Martha Beck played by Shirley Stoller. Um, she's overweight. She's a nurse. She's living with her mother in Mobile, Alabama. And all of a sudden you're this, exotic, exciting, you know, dashing Don Juan figure. You bring her to New York and, and uh, pull her into the con. But also your character can go from charming to chilling and murderous. How, how did you, you know, you, you, you must have liked the range of that character. There was a lot of range to play in him. Yeah, well, that's just my personality. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, uh, you know, as an actor, you, uh, um, you, <clears throat> there's so many things, uh, you know, people ask you, how do you become an actor and you know, constantly, you know, and so on and so forth. And it's with great observation, uh, a uh, willingness to transform uh, and a willingness to allow it to seep in and understand that it is not, you're in charge, but, and not allow it to affect you in a, in, in a bad way, but to use all that you can see and imagine. And that's, and you're, you're the boss. You're in charge of you doing all that. So if you're confident in, your, confident in yourself, in a, I, I'm fortunate. I had a great background. I had mother and a father and family and loving and brothers, two beautiful brothers. We loved each other, tremendous. We were the talk of, of everywhere. The three of us were, were so close with each other. Other families admired us tremendously, including our own families mm -hmm. and relatives. <clears throat> and I also grew up with uncles and background and stories. You know, today people don't have any stories to tell from, from really deep background. I, you know, I'm fortunate enough, my mother and father came from poverty. Fortunate enough, I say, and that should be a lesson to a lot of people. You don't become a victim of your circumstances. You use that for your benefit in your warehouse, your warehouse of life to enrich you with knowledge and history. It's good stuff that you know what the ground floor is. You know what, the, what not having is. So that when you grow up, whether you're an actor or a human, uh, you, you have all that, that stuff in you that you can call upon and remember and, and, and allow it to happen and have the ability to, to again, be the, the, the owner of all this. That's a beautiful reminder for life and for acting. Um, Absolutely. But, but this, so obviously this was your first film. It was very important. You've done over a hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're well known for Fiorella LaGuardia and many other roles. How do you consider this over your long career, uh, this role in The Honeymoon Killers? Uh, do you consider it one of your best performances? Is it, a, is it a special performance? Is it? You know, when I think of The Honeymoon Killers, I think of the movie itself. And I think the movie is, is, was done very well, uh, shot extremely well. 
and the women in the movie were acting great. Every woman in that movie was fantastic. Uh, I couldn't ask for better women in a movie than that. And so when I think of the honeymoon killers, I think of the reality of it. I think it looks so real, so natural. It looks like a documentary in a way, because it, it, they don't look like actors. It really and, is. It has that cinema verity quality. But the reaction, I want to talk about the reaction. I mean, the movie is sexual. It's very violent in places. Um, and some people in 1970 were not ready for that. I, I read it got banned in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of critics uh, uh, claimed your, your performance in the movie as a whole. And then people like Francis Tuf Tufeau called it one of his favorite films. Steve Buscemi, the actor, called it one of his favorite films. It's had a, a long life um, on DVD with the Criterion film collection and, and things. Um, but what did you remember from the reaction? Yes, I do remember that the movie getting banned here and there, you know, but you see <clears throat> the, the, the um, again, the, I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but the, but the murders in the movie or the murder in the movie are, are not uh, like today. You see today you got to show people getting blown up and, and, and smashed against walls and whatever effects they can throw in there. This was, this was not that. This was horrible in its in its story of, of exactly what was that was scary to talk about to talk about the the uh you know the scene when he's again i don't want to talk about the movie no, that's but, okay but, people have probably seen it yeah okay but he's talking to the to the elderly woman at the end janet right. Fay. the whole the whole way it's shot and the and and the way i'm i'm conning her and so on it's very that's very scary more scary than than it's like it's like you know i mean the, the, today they go naked on, in the in the in the film totally right. naked you don't have to do that right you don't have to do that you have you, you you're, you're more naked with clothes on if right. you know how to do it and so so in in that you don't have to you don't have to show the gory blood of so on and so forth. Uh, you just you just lay it up and put it in the audience's mind. They right. do it better than you. That's the whole point. Let the audience see it. Let the audience mind go to to what's happening. And that's where you're creative. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. Making I, I love the, the black and white. It, it, it's timeless. I mean, the, the, the way the shadows are captured, the, the texture of it. Talk about, you know, most of your films have been in color, obviously, but talk about this black and white film and how that stands out. And, and when you see it, um, you know, what do you think when you see it in black and white? Well, I love it. I love it. I'm a big fan of history and I'm a big fan of black and white movies, you know, and I think that's a, one of the problems in our country is they don't understand history. They don't, they're not interested in history. They don't know what's going on. They're trying to invent the wheel. The wheel is already invented and you can't create anything unless you know what the past was uh -huh. so that, so that you know what to build on. And in black and white, in this, in this movie, I feel like I'm part of the Cagney Bogart, uh, you know, <laughs> Gable, you know, those, those kind of uh, Edward G. Robinson times where the movies were movies. Right. With stories with stories. Right. And this, this movie fits into that uh, probably uh, subconsciously. And it's one of my favorite films. When I, and as a matter of fact, the movie I'm doing now, I'm doing a movie, by the way, with uh, uh, Ray Romano Great. and uh, yeah, Laurie Metcalf. And uh, it is a, uh, I think it's a marvelous movie. We have some, we have some young actors on the thing and they keep asking me what movies of mine that should they see right. and matter of fact just last week i said honeymoon killers go go see that because because nice. yeah, i'm trying to bring them along with history right and i'm trying to bring everybody along with history and right. going back to see what real what was what was the history this is just why when you ask me a question about how i got to here i go back to history yeah. I go back to my roots. I go back to my, and I, you know, never ever forget your roots, especially if they're good with your mother and your father and your brothers and your uncles and, and so on. And listen to those stories, those great stories of struggle. When my mother and father at, at eight years old are taken out of school and how to support the family. And it's not a myth. It's not, they're not just, just, just words. 
right? Yeah, and, and she was uh, sewing coats at eight years old. And when the inspectors came around, they had to hide her in the, in the bathroom from the inspectors. Those kind of stories, right. uh, you know, are, are real. And, I, and you understand what struggle is. And so, I think the best films tell great mm -hmm. stories. I think The Honeymoon Killers tells an amazing story. It pulls yeah. you into the beginning. It's not focused on special effects and CEG and, and, and right. everything. But let me ask you about what your memories of shooting. A lot of it was shot in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, but also yeah. in Albany. Do you remember any of those specific locations? Were any of them challenging? Um, I think the, the, the whole movie itself was what people would consider challenging right. because it was a very low budget movie. Yeah. And uh, uh, so you, 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 who knew though, who, who cared? As you know, challenge, nothing is challenging when you're, when you're, uh, you know, doing your first film and uh, believe me, I'm, I'm like a, a, a tiger uh, with uh, when, when it comes to, to challenge, challenging, yeah. challenging is good. I love, I love difficult. I love difficult because that's where you learn right. and, and you overcome, you know, and, 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 and you know, you have to be a fighter. Well, I used to be a boxer. So it's in the Golden Gloves and so on and so forth. Oh, this is great yeah. for, we've got our students will be watching this, young filmmakers. Okay. I think you're giving, you know, good inspiration for all of them. Let me ask you, how often do you take out the DVD or, or just watch it or, or show it to friends or, or whatever? Well, I, we have, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some people say, hey, let's watch your movies. You know, it's the first one I pull out. Right. Uh, you know, and, and the second movie was uh, The French Connection, a five a five time a time Academy Award winning couple of great <laughs> films right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, you know, interesting, the uh, uh, French Connection. <clears throat> this is the plight of an actor. Uh, uh, Phil D'Antoni, the producer of the the, uh, the French Connection and Seven Ups, both films of which I was in. Um, uh, and and William Friedkin, the director of French Connection, they watched the Honeymoon Killers, and one of them said, "Let's get him for Sal Boker in the French Connection." And the other one said, "No, he's got he's Spanish, he's got a Spanish accent." Now, the, happened to be a person behind me, uh, beside, uh, behind them, the casting director said, "No, no, no, he he, he doesn't have an accent. He, he's he's a New Yorker." So if it weren't for him. I would have not got the part, that's and great. and but but you see that's the plight of an actor, uh, being uh, playing different roles. When you play different roles, like I I do, I try to do, uh, people say, oh, that's that's who he is, right. and it's not who I am. It's who I who I portray. Yeah, I, I think your your roles are so varied. You've never been typecast, which is which is a, a great thing. So I guess finally, you've been really generous with your time, uh, uh, Tony. I hope I can call you Tony after this Absolutely. conversation. Can you say what your role is in this Ray Romano film? Or can, can you talk at all about it? Or? Sure. It's, uh, I think it's going to be a good movie. I think it really is because it's got a lot of, uh, of a pathos and it's, it, it's a, um, the actors. The Ray, Ray did a great job in casting the actors because they're all wonderful and, and like each other. Very important. Uh, and you, you see, you get a big family feeling because they are family in, in the movie. And uh, it's about a young man uh, who, Ray, I, I play Ray's father, ah. okay? And Ray's son uh, is a shy, he plays basketball, but when he's on a basketball court, he's not shy. But in life he is, he's very timid. And uh, Ray, Ray is a screw up basically um, on the job. I, I own a construction company with my, with, and I have, I have my two sons work for me. Uh, Sebastian Malascalco is, is the, my other son. And I have the, and he has two boys and they all work in this construction company. And I want Ray's son, the, the shy one, to come and join us. And Ray, Ray wants him to play basketball at a, at a high school, at his college. And, uh, and I'm thinking, what, what is he waste? He's gonna, not gonna play for the Knicks, right? You know, he should come, come work. He's going to, what, he's going to waste his four years to college and so on. And so, on. so, but there's a whole thing that Ray is living through uh, uh, the son. Right. If, and he's a, he's a, a Rocky fan. Rocky, um, not Marciano, uh, by the way, who I played in the movie, but uh, uh, Rocky, the movie with Stallone. Yeah, Balboa. He quotes, yeah. He quotes a lot of Stallone. In the, in the movie, a lot of a lot of Rocky 
uh, uh, in, in the movie. And so he's like a fan uh, uh, and lives in a different, a different kind of world of, uh, of fantasy. And he tried to live through his son. And it's, it's very complicated, but it's funny. It's quite fun. So it's, 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 what do they call it? A drama comedy? I don't, I don't know. Forget right, the word. yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a comedy. great stand-up comic, and and I'm glad he's directing now. Um, and and starring. Yeah, he's directing. He wrote the script, and he's acting. God bless him. Yeah. I so, um, finally, we're going to be screening the Honeymoon Killers on the big Malta Drive-in screen. It's been going for seventy years. Wow. This film is is now over fifty years considered wow. a classic by so many film lovers and, and cinephiles. What would you want to say to the audience to either introduce this film or, or what you hope they take away from it? Well, I'll tell you, it, it all comes down to talent. You can have no money when it comes down to story and talent. Uh, as I say, all the women in this movie are magnificent and the, uh, the way the cinematographer shot it and, and uh, it was directed in some way or other. Uh, you just have to, have to devote yourself to what you're doing, care about what you're doing and have the, uh, that uh, uh, confidence that you are going to create something uh, wonderful. If you have something to say, say it from your heart you know, and, and be honest and look at history. History is the key to everything. You cannot create it if you don't know about it. People ask, you know, if you're a pessimist, an optimist or a realist, you have to be a realist first. Then you can interpret whether you're a pessimist or an optimist. You have to know what's really going on. And then you make your choice. This is a, a delightful conversation. Yeah. Um, you've given a lot of inspiration to aspiring actors, young filmmakers. We really appreciate you being part of the Albany Film Festival. Tony Lobianco, the star of The Honeymoon Killers, also uh, more than 100 roles uh, on stage and screen, uh, Emmy Awards, and now in a new forthcoming film by Ray Romano. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for all your people who are watching and are going to watch the film. God bless you all. Thank you.